Welcome to a new broadcast from Hour of the Truth with Jogler 66 and with um, Inquisition Update or Jörg Glissmann and Tom Fress. We are gathered here together via Skype for the 18th time to do a study of the complete and perfect fulfillment of Jesus Christ of the 70th week of Daniel prophecy and we prove that in the New Testament. Also here and there a little in the Old Testament text but most and for all the New Testament, because without Jesus being the Christ, without Jesus having fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel, there even would not be any New Testament. That's a very, very important point that we have to think about when some futurists come and tell us the 70th week of Daniel is yet to be fulfilled. Don't be deceived. And I think that is the same tone that Tom will tell you also, the same subject, Welcome to the broadcast, Tom, and I'm very glad to have you on again, and we are doing this now for the next probably 18th time. Hello. Yes, uh, thanks for having me. It's my pleasure, privilege, and blessing to be here, and uh, you're correct. I have said it before. I've said it so many times. Uh, I'm sure people are probably getting tired of hearing it, but uh, uh, the gospel has gone to the Gentiles. It's been in the hands of the Gentiles for nearly 2,000 years. Why? Because the 70th week of Daniel ended 2,000 years ago. The gospel was to be preached one last time to Jesus' brethren. Seventy times, seven times. He was preaching the gospel of the kingdom in Christ's blood to his Jewish brethren for the last time. And then, if they rejected him and his gospel and his blood and his salvation and his redemption and his glorification, then the gospel would be given to the Gentiles to evangelize the world. And that's exactly what happened 2,000 years ago at the very end of the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy. And no one can argue the fact about the 70th week of Daniel being over simply by the fact, the undeniable, visible fact that the Gentile world now is the dispenser of God's grace through the gospel and the blood and the redemption of Jesus Christ, not the Jews. 
and this is proof positive. This is this is what anyone can use to argue against anyone who claims that the 70th week of Daniel or any portion of it is yet to be fulfilled in the future. You can say, uh-uh, not so. The Gentiles have been spreading the gospel alone for 2,000 years. The 70th week of Daniel ended 2,000 years ago, or we would not be holding the gospel and disseminating the gospel to the world. And uh, that, uh, that the Gentiles are now those who are preaching the gospel and evangelizing the world and not the Jew is proof positive. Daniel's 70th week is over. And you stated it well, and I stated it again, just to show the unity and truth of, of, of our relationship. That's what binds us together as brethren, the truth, that the 70th week of Daniel is over. It was fulfilled in Christ 2,000 years ago. Messiah the Prince, the Prince that shall come. You know, in the volume of the book, the Law and the Prophets, it was spoken of him that he would reconcile us to God, that he would put an end of sin, and make reconciliation for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness. And that's what he did in the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy. The first seven weeks and the following 62 weeks, making 69 weeks altogether, had everything to do with reestablishing the temple and Jerusalem and rebuilding the wall and the government of, of, of Israel, the Sanhedrin. The final week had to do with nothing but the ministry that Messiah was sent in this world to perform, and that was man's redemption. And that's what it was all about. And for anybody to say that the 70th week of Daniel or any portion of it is yet to be fulfilled in the future just proves their unfitness to preach in God's church. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, you say the unfitness to, pre uh, to preach in God's church, but uh, is there a God's church today anyway, anywhere to be found? In my opinion, you do not find any quote-unquote congregation out there that preaches the true word of God. You do not find any quote-unquote big churches that preach the word of God. It is only little assemblies, two or three people together. And I think that is precisely what Jesus had in mind when he said in the in the Gospel of Matthew, wherever two or three of you are gathered together in my name, in their midst will I be. That's because right. he, when he went away, he sent us the Comforter. So when he says he will be in the midst of those two and three people, that means that he will send the Comforter. He is there in the form of the Comforter. He is physically in heaven, but his Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is here with us, leads us into all truth if we diligently, diligently study his word, study the Bible, study his truth, and understand that Jesus is the Christ, that the papacy is the Antichrist, that he fulfilled Daniel's prophecy 2,000 years ago of Daniel chapter 9, especially verses 24 through 27, and that by with him going to the cross, it is all finished. And then the prophecy is sealed up and locked away until the end of time, until only one who is able to open the book, Jesus, will open it and will show to the world, see, I told you so. Exactly right. That's going to happen in heaven. The book of Revelation uh, 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 it discovers that truth to us, that no one, no one is authorized to remove the seals of the scroll of Daniel's prophecy. No one is to open once again that prophecy or that vision. It is sealed up, and it will be remain sealed until the one who sealed it opens it again. And that's Christ in heaven and the book of Revelation that describes that event. And uh, you are absolutely right. 
That's when all eyes will see, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that the 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled by Christ in a seven-year period. Uh, 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 the, the ending of the 69th week, the beginning of the 70th week in the baptism of Jesus in the River Jordan, and the seven years later, the stoning of Stephen and the gospel going to the Gentiles. Whereas in the midst of the week, he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease by becoming the sacrifice himself. And it is finished. Man's redemption is wholly accomplished. Nothing to be added, nothing to be taken away. Our salvation is in Jesus and him only. He's the Alpha and Omega of our faith. He did it without our assistance, and that's what makes it perfect. You know, that's the that's difference with the Old Covenant, it. Tom. That's yep. that's the difference with uh, difference with the uh, with the Old Covenant that was made at Mount Sinai. That is why this everlasting covenant had to be sealed by Jesus Christ, or had to be fulfilled by Jesus Christ, because the old one was faulty. It, That's right. It uh, included man. Mm -hmm. Man was not responsible for his salvation, don't understand me wrong, but man was responsible for acting certain rituals to make sure that uh, he understood God's plan of salvation. Mm -hmm. But man changed these God-given rituals. Mm -hmm. These rituals are written down in the book of, the, uh, of Leviticus, the third book of Moses. You know, mm -hmm. It's called the Levitical Law. And it included man. Man was not part of his salvation. He never was. But man was there to perform these rituals to show to the other men, when you do this, you have a sign of, or shadow of things to come. And that yep. shadow is Jesus Christ when he will be the perfect sacrifice. That's but right. what did they do? They built sun images. They used animals that were not clean. They even used swine, if I'm not mistaken. I think that is historically recorded in books outside of the Bible. And we know that they um, went away from the law of God and they went to worship Baal. Yep. So man broke the covenant he had with God. And God then had to renew the everlasting covenant, and man had nothing to do with it. And that's the point. When Jesus went to the cross, he went there without the help of any man. He shed his blood without the help of any man, where, as opposite, the blood of sheep and goats and bulls was shed with the help of man. That's but right. this time, no man had anything to do with it, because God knows if man has anything to do with his own salvation, let's put it this way to make it even sharper in the understanding of the listener, he will screw it up. That's right. Every example given in the Bible where man participated in the Temple Mount worship uh, always ended in disaster. They either perverted it or they began to see it in an, in an unholy light like somehow or other the blood of lambs and goats actually did atone for sin, where they were, it was never intended to teach that fact. It was always intended to teach that the blood of lambs and goats were typifications of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, Christ himself. And they began to look at the sacrifices on Temple Mount, much like a Roman Catholic looks at the sacrifice of the Mass, that it somehow... Uh, redeems them from their sins. That the wafer and the and the wine that, that is drunk by the priest somehow is the literal blood, body, soul, and divinity of Christ and literally takes away sin. Independent of Christ. And uh, that's nothing but damnation. And the ritual took on a whole different meaning the example given to them of, Ab of, of, of Moses 
to sacrifice lambs and goats and pigeons and doves to, and confess their sins and to have them washed away uh, by the high priest was not a typification of Jesus, but was efficacious in and of itself. They began to have all their faith in a ritual. Now look, if, if the blood of lambs and goats had the power to wash away sin, then Christ died in vain, did he not? You see what they did? They misconstrued that which Moses gave them, that which God gave them in the law, a substitute until Christ came. And uh, uh, any Jew who understood God's law of sa animal sacrifice would have been very anxious to give up animal sacrifices and that whole bloody mess on Temple Mount and just believe in the one sacrifice that takes away all sin for all men for all time and never make a blood sacrifice again. That's true salvation. Man has no part in it. Christ did it alone. Even, even with his own disciples resisting him from going to the cross, he performed his prophetic role as Messiah, Redeemer, Priest, and King. And now it is finished. It's over. No more sacrifice for sin. And if you believe there's another sacrifice that must be offered, whether you're a Roman Catholic giving sacrifice of the Mass or a Jew on Temple Mountain, Israel, giving animal sacrifices, you've simply re repudiated, you've rejected the blood of Christ shed once and for all, for all men, for all time. Jesus was the sacrifice to end all all sacrifices. And it says in Daniel's prophecy that very thing. He will cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. And that's how we know how to identify any false religion. If that religion offers anything by the way of sacrifice for redemption or for some uh, uh, restoration of, of, of peace, uh, and the basins of, 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 a, of a God is a false religion. You can instantly recognize every false religion by simply observing whether they make sacrifices or not. God's people who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb wouldn't think to make a sacrifice. It's understood that they would be rejecting the blood of the Lamb of God. And we abhor any such proposal. And yet most, if not the lion's share of Christians today, take the same attitude as uh, the Roman Catholic Church that for the redemption of the Jews, they need to make sacrifice, just like the Roman Catholics do. <clears throat> now, obviously, the Roman Catholics don't sacrifice a live animal like the Jews will do. But a sacrifice is a sacrifice. Whether it's bloody, like the Jews do, or an unbloody sacrifice, like the Catholics do, a sacrifice is a sacrifice. And it is designed to replace the sacrifice of Jesus. It is de designed to deny the sacrifice of Jesus. And here we have the whole Christian world, Catholic, Protestant, Evangelical, Charismatic, every brand of Christianity, looking forward to the day when a Jewish temple will be built on Temple Mount and animal sacrifices restored. Think about it. You can't get more deceived than that. Think about it. Horror of horrors is the reality of Christendom today. 
you can't underestimate the delusion of Christendom today. You can't overstate it. And uh, I will no longer participate in it. God has graciously brought me out of that delusion. Thank God Yerk has never been in that delusion. But we can think with a clear mind. We can understand the scriptures. We can understand history. Because we have not been tainted. Or we are, no, in my case, no longer tainted with the futurist delusion. We know there is no future fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. Any talk of a future fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel or any portion of it is the most rank apostasy and the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. And it denies that Jesus was the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel 2,000 years ago. Therefore, he was not the Messiah. Do you see the ultimate goal of futurism? It is to cause you to deny that Jesus was the fulfillment of it. That it was not Jesus who brought in everlasting righteousness that it was not Jesus who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease, that it was not Jesus who brought reconciliation for iniquity, it was not Jesus who put, put an end to sin, that that can only be done in the future by someone else. That is the whole purpose of futurism. To get you to deny the Christ that bought you. The Christ that redeemed you. The Christ that saved you. The Christ that glorified you. So that you will die in your sins. That's the whole purpose of futurism. Is to undo what Jesus Christ did 2,000 years ago. And to get you to utter with your own mouth that Jesus is not the Christ. If you say that the 70th week of Daniel is future, you have already said that Jesus was not the Christ. Back to you, Yerk. And when you say that Jesus was not the Christ, you deny that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, and that means that you are led by the spirit of Antichrist. That's right. And that's why the Bible says we have to measure every spirit against the word of God and that's see right. if they are of God. Because there are good spirits, or a good spirit, and there are bad spirits. And you have mm -hmm. to test these spirits against the word of God. And if that spirit that leads you weekly into your congregation, into your gathering of what you call church, into that community of ecclesia, whatever you name you want to put on it, whether you're in a mega church or just in a, in, in a home church or wherever you are, and there people say that the 70th week of Daniel is yet future, then you should recognize that as a lie. Because your spirit, if it is the Holy Spirit that leads you into all truth, as Jesus Christ promised us before he went up to heaven, that he will send the Comforter, will lead us into all truth. If that spirit does not lead you into that truth, you are following a wrong spirit. And there are many wrong spirits, because there are many fallen angels. There are many so-called ministers of righteousness who are fallen angels who just perform works for the fallen head angel, Lucifer, who became Satan when he fell on the earth, and Satan is, uh, is transformed into an angel of light. The Bible says that. Now, where do you expect to see an angel of light? 
in your church, after the pulpit, preaching to you the word of God. You expect a man of righteousness there. But if you do not test the words these so-called minister of righteousness teaches you, when you don't measure that against the only correct Bible that you are able to hold in your hand if you are an English-speaking man or woman in this world, that is the AV 1611 King James Bible, and the words don't hold up, well, then you got to go out of that church. you got to better run out of that church. And you better warn your brethren, because truth is not told there. And let's let's be plain about that. When you go to a church and there is not spoken the truth, what's the church then for? Isn't that a place where you can share the truth, the only truth in this world? Isn't that the last sanctuary that you have in all this world of lying and deceiving media, politics and everything around us that indoctrinates us every day with all the lies of the devil? Isn't the church, the congregation that we have, the fl that we flee to, the last sanctuary that we have for the truth? And what all of a sudden, if you see that there, even there, is not taught the truth, what to do then? Well, I can tell you what to do then. Tom can tell you what to do then. But why not listening to Tom? Because he, Tom has been in that situation. I, as he said, have never been churched. But Tom has been churched his whole life. He made that experience. And what can you do when you come to the conclusion that every preacher and every teacher of every congregation you ever have been in is only telling you sugar-coated lies. Tom, what can you do? Well, I'll tell you what I did. I kicked the dust off my feet, and I've never darkened the door of another church. And I trust the Holy Spirit to preserve me and to teach me and to guide me and direct me through the written Word of God. I read the scriptures, and I pray and ask the Holy Spirit to teach me, because I no longer trust the futurist pastors. I no longer trust the futurist congregations. I no longer trust futurist people, whether they be friends, foes, or even family. My most beloved are futurists, and I cannot trust them. I cannot sit in their company. I cannot share their beliefs. And how can two walk together unless they agree? So I've been set apart, truly sanctified. I don't know anybody in my life that's more sanctified and set apart than I am. I live virtually alone in this world. And I've found fellowship with Yerk and a handful of others and I'm, they're, they, they live so far from me, I don't even know what they look like. They're just voices to me. They're just spirits to me. And when we get together, we read and discuss the scriptures in the new light of historicism. We believe the 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled 2,000 years ago by the only Messiah. Prince Jesus. We believe that shortly thereafter, as Paul instructed, the man of sin was revealed after the restrainer, the Caesars, were taken out of the way. And we believe that the, that the papal Caesar, who, who, who now rules and reigns over God's heritage and over the kings of the earth, and who persecutes the saints of the Most High, for 2,000 years has been drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. The papacy is, was, and always will be the man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn, the antichrist, the beast, the Judas priest, the one who blasphemes God by thinking that he can change God's times and his laws, change his Sabbath, change his laws, his Ten Commandments, into something else called Roman Catholic canon law, and then enforce it upon every man, woman, and child on the planet 
in the form of civil laws written by the kings of the earth who are nothing but the vassals of the man of sin in Rome. And it becomes our spiritual bounden duty to preach Christ and him crucified, the redemption that he alone gives, and to preach against the Antichrist and the kings of the earth over which he rules. That is the bounden duty of the saints of Almighty God. And that's what the saints of Almighty God have done throughout the 2,000-year history of the quote-unquote Church of Jesus Christ, the saints of Almighty God, those who have been called, those who have been chosen, those who have been sanctified, those who have been justified, and those who will be glorified at Christ's return. That is our lot in life, to tell the truth and to suffer persecution because of it. And the ground, the, the, the earth is soaked with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus who have done just that. We don't play churchianity anymore. We don't teach carefully devised fables anymore. We accept our God-given lot in this life to be living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. And if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, and he's not a priest of this world. We have an advocate with the Father, Christ Jesus, who bore our sins on his body. He is our mediator, our priest, and our king, and we confessed our sins to him in private. And what we confess to him in private, he forgives and, cl and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And we trust him. And we look for help nowhere else. We look for truth in nowhere else. No one else. It's Christ and him only. Him only do we serve and worship and obey. And it's very expensive. It's very costly. It has been for 2,000 years. It has cost the wealth, the health, the prosperity, the property, the heritage, the children, the gold, the land, the sustenance, the peace, the protection, and every other thing that the saints have enjoyed. And they now become the property of the man of sin in Rome who can't even calculate his wealth and who keeps his wealth hidden from the, 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 the tax collectors, keeps his infinite, incalculable wealth hidden from the auditors. No man may see the books of the man of sin in Rome because he's above God's law. He's exalted his throne above the stars of God. He set his throne above that of God. He's like the Most High. And he's worshipped by the vast majority. Worshipped and obeyed by the vast majority of the world, including Christians. Christians. And we are his most lethal enemy. Because what? We carry no weapons. We're no physical threat to anyone. But we carry the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. A two-edged sword that, when drawn, cuts both directions. Swing it right, it cuts. Swing it left, it cuts. And it takes no prisoners. That's what it is to be a saint in the kingdom of heaven. 
you lose all your earthly loyalties, all your earthly patriotism. You realize that the kingdoms of this earth will soon be the kingdoms of Christ Almighty. So why put your faith and hope and trust in a temporary, earthly, sinful, wicked, finite kingdom? Why not place all of your hopes and trust in the kingdom of Christ, so far invisible, but which will soon be revealed to every eye on the planet. I've already made my allegiance with the king of that eternal kingdom. It's the only kingdom that will ever bring in Christ's righteousness. It's the only kingdom in which I will ever be truly free. It's the only kingdom that will ever give me the righteousness of Christ and the riches of the universe. That's where my faith, hope, and trust is now. And you know what? It was a gift. No charge. It was free. And it can't be taken away. Back to you, York. Yeah, the gift was free, Tom. The only thing you had to do was to give up the lies in this world. And we can assure the listener that we don't sugarcoat the truth in this broadcast. And we are not speaking politically correct. But the truth is not politically correct. Because political correctness is the lie of the devil. And we don't sell the lies of the devil. We sell the truth from Almighty God. And that's why we go into the paper that uh, we studied already a few times. And uh, today is the time to, I think, go in again of it a little bit. And it starts with a question. We are still analyzing Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. For the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. What does that mean? Jesus reminded the Jews of Daniel's prophecy on abomination of desolation. This was fulfilled in 70 AD when Romans destroyed the temple and built altars for heathen abominable gods on the Temple Mount. In Matthew 24, verse 15 and following, we read about this. It says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. In a parallel text to Matthew 24:15. Jesus told his disciples, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, speaking of the Roman armies led by Prince Titus, then know that its desolation is near. We read that in Luke chapter 21, verse 20. The disciples did see those very events. They were life participators of that. Luke chapter 21, verse 20 reads, and when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Jesus told them, See, your house, not my house, your house is left to you desolate. In Matthew 23, 38. Thus, Gabriel's statement in Daniel Chapter 9, verse 27, about Jerusalem becoming desolate, was perfectly fulfilled in 70 AD. Your house is left to you desolate. It is your house because I, the God of this world, doesn't dwell there and don't dwell there anymore. The veil of the temple 
have been torn in two parts from bottom to uh, from top to bottom at the moment when Jesus Christ gave up the ghost and said it is finished that is the moment when God left the building no it was not Elvis that left the building it was God that left the building and he left that house to them them who still do not accept the once and for all perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ but wanted to get back in that house built of stones by men to sacrifice and to not accept the one and only holy sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It became their house, the house of God it was before, it is not anymore. Your house is left to you desolate. Tom, I know that this is a verse or a part of a verse, and this is an expression, your house is left to you desolate, that you very much love to explain a little bit deeper to our listeners. Yes, it says, your house is left unto you desolate. And there's no word, no word anywhere in the Bible that, that God will again occupy and dwell in a temple made with hands. God said, I no longer dwell in temples made with hands. He said, further, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. In you will I dwell. Okay? Is he going to change his mind about that if the Jews build a temple? No, the Bible says your house is left unto you desolate, even unto the consummation. Now, many expositors will say that the consummation came at the end of the war in 70 A.D. But I say the consummation is the return of Christ. And that house, if there is ever one built in Jerusalem on Temple Mount, supposed to be the temple of God, God will not dwell in it. From day one, it will be desolate. On the last day, it will be desolate. And every day in between will be desolate. You will not find God or his glory or anything of his in that temple. It will not be called the temple of God. It will be the temple of Antichrist. And you'll have a choice to make. Who is Christ? The future man in a future temple? Or was it Jesus 2,000 years ago? That's what this is all about, folks. That's what futurism is all about. And I don't want anyone within the sound of my voice to be deceived any longer. And... Something else I want you all to take to heart. I'm just a man just like you. A sinner saved by the grace and mercy of Almighty God through the shed blood of Jesus. It's to him that I owe all, even my knowledge of this great delusion called futurism. Were it not for him and his mercy, I would still be believing the futurist delusion just as deluded as the rest of the so-called Christian world, unable to help anyone. But he's delivered me, miraculously. And now I understand how deeply deceived I was. And now I offer, as freely as I can make it, the same help that God gave me, the truth, the inarguable, unattestable truth, uncontestable truth, I correct myself, so that you be free of this phony Christianity and learn to trust Christ and Him alone. And there's something else. Unlike most, I don't have a book to sell you. 
I don't have merchandise to sell you. I don't have empty promises to sell you. Everything I think, do, and say was given to me freely by his grace. And everything I give to you is just as free. Never will I be accused of profiting from the truth and selling the truth. The Bible says, buy the truth and sell it not. That's what I'm doing. So receive the gift with thanksgiving and praises to the gift giver, the one who gave us salvation freely as a gift. Christ Jesus, Messiah the Prince, the Prince that shall come in Daniel's 70-week prophecy. He's the only one we can trust. If you trust a man or a system of men or government of men or anything else in this world, you will be deceived. And you've seen now, surely by now, you've seen that <clears throat> you've already been deceived as I was. Wholly and completely deceived as was I. So who can you trust? Are you still going to run to the polls in a vain attempt to do your quote-unquote patriotic duty in a nation that it was doomed from the start to elect a president that is handpicked by the papacy? What hope is there? Ask yourself this question. Did any of the Christians of the first century run to Rome to elect the next Caesar? The answer is obvious. God's people had no hope in politics, no hope in Caesar, no hope in the papal Caesar either. No hope in men. No hope in this world. So stop viewing it as your quote-unquote patriotic duty to go to the polls and put lipstick on a pig and contribute to your own delusion and a false hope that men whether they be in your local state or whether they be in Washington, D.C., can be the solution to your problems. We got in this mess because of wayward pastors, phony priests, and phony politicians, all of them made of the same sinful flesh as we all. Stop hoping for miracles from sinful men and sinful man-made organizations and laws that contradict God's holy, eternal, and immutable law. You have no obligation but to Christ and your families and to the saints. You have a king, you have a kingdom, and you have a constitution. It's called the kingdom of Christ. And his king is righteous and holy and just. And the Constitution is written in black and white for you to read in your own language that you need no help to understand. But the leading and teaching of the Holy Spirit. That's what it is to live in the kingdom of Christ. Let loose your grip on a dying corpse called America, called the world. And prepare yourself to meet your maker, your savior and friend. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, when you were speaking about the politics and people going to the polls and choosing one or the other 
person as a president. I think what people just have to understand in that regard is that the source of the problem can never provide the solution of the problem. That's right. And that should also make very clear to you why the Roman Catholic Church is the diabolical church that Tom and I preach it is. Because the Roman Catholic Church preaches that Jesus gave to Peter the keys. That Jesus said to Peter, on, your, on you I will build my church. On fallible man. Aren't there in the Bible at least two, if not more, examples where Peter denied Jesus? Where he had to be rectified? Where he had to be set aright again? And on that man, Jesus Christ would build his church? And the Roman Catholic Church says we are the apostolic succession of that man? And because he, on him, was built the church, the church is now built on us. Don't you see the folly in that? Don't you understand what we spoke about in the beginning of this broadcast when we said that man has nothing to do with its salvation? What is putting the man on the foundation of the church, if not that? Hey, right, Tom? I think exactly this is exactly right. I think this is a point we should elaborate a little bit more about. This is such a folly. Everybody with two working brain cells can understand that the Roman Catholic Church can never be the Church of God if the Church of God is built on fallible man, because not one man is righteous. We all fall short in the glory, uh, of the glory of God. We are all born in trespasses and sins. On trespasses and sins you cannot build a righteous church. Here you already have an absolute proof that the Roman Catholic Church is selling you baloney. It's exactly right. They hold the same place as did the Pharisees and the chief priests and scribes that Jesus loathed and detested and, 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 and criticized. They said that they sat in Moses' seat, that they were the successors of Moses. And yet Jesus reviled them at every opportunity. Shouldn't we expect that Jesus will be just as reviled uh, against the priests of the Roman Catholic Church who say they sit in Peter's seat? Or more exactly, they sit in Christ's seat? Is not the title of the Pope the Vicar of Christ as well as, as the successor of Peter? Can you imagine the conflict that exists as we speak between Christ and this phony in Rome? That's what the Protestant reformers recognized. That while they were Roman Catholics, Pope worshiping Roman Catholics a day before, there came a day when they realized that the papacy was indeed as the Protestants of old, all the way back to the first century, said without ceasing, the papacy is the Antichrist. And by the mercy of Almighty God, those former Roman Catholics came out in protest from the Roman Catholic Church. They were called Protestants and they exposed all the false doctrine, all the false belief, all the idolatry, all the sexual immorality, all the thievery, all the indulgences, all the decadence, all the pedophilia, 
all the sodomy, all the simony, all the sins of the Roman Catholic Church, and they implored everyone that remained within that church to come out for the sake of Christ and for the sake of your own salvations, come out of that church before it's too late. By the grace of Almighty God, they were forgiven, and they rendered to us the wisdom and knowledge that they gained from the Scriptures. And what do we have now, 500 years later? A whole nation of self-professing pastors and priesters who are leading us all lock, stock, and barrel down the primrose path to perdition to ecumenically reunite with the Roman Catholic Church as if we were all Christians. Horror of horrors! The great apostasy has seen its fullness. That great apostasy that Paul saw the beginning of before his demise has now come full circle, fully developed, so much so that it is able to deceive the very elect of God. Don't you be a part of it. <clears throat> To be united with the Antichrist Church of Rome is to be unhinged from the grace of Almighty God. You got a choice to make. Who are you going to serve? Who are you going to obey? Who are you going to worship? If you don't make your stand by default, you'll be added to the kingdom of Antichrist and you'll be treated thusly. The Bible says, don't reconcile with her. It says, come out of her, my people, that you partake not of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath not forgiven her iniquities. He has remembered her iniquities. And that which she has perpetrated on this earth will be, will be added to her. The judgment of the Roman Catholic Church is imminent. I don't mean today or tomorrow. But Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen. God's judgment will come in an hour. It'll come with the brightness of his return and the spirit of his mouth. And the whole world will see her burning. And I wouldn't want to be within a country mile of a Roman Catholic church or an ecumenical evangelibelly church that has ecumenically reunited with her because they have partaken of her sins and they will indeed receive of her plagues. There's a terrible cost for taking light the salvation of Jesus and making ecumenical inroads with one not your spouse, the man of sin, the counterfeit Christ, the Judas priest of Rome. You cannot serve two masters. You either serve Christ or you serve Antichrist. Those are the clear choices given in the Scripture. I hope somehow Yerk and I have helped you see the difference between the two so that you can distinguish between the holy and the profane, the true and the counterfeit, heaven and and hell. Back to you, York. Jesus fulfilled all the prophecies in the 70-week prophecy. There's no place for Antichrist in the whole of chapter 9 of Daniel. If someone teaches you that anything in chapter 9 of Daniel deals with Antichrist, you know that you are speaking to a deceiver. 
In the beginning, Tom already made the point that the 70th week ended. When did it end? The 70 weeks ended in the year 34. The whole 70-week prophecy of 490 years with the final 70th week ended in AD 34. Gabriel said that the 70-week prophecy specifically applied to the Jewish people. And we read that in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Huh? It is about, um, he said, uh, thy people and thy holy city. Right? During the Lord's public ministry of three and a half years, the Master's focus was largely upon the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It says so in Matthew chapter 10, verse 6. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. After his resurrection, and then for another three and a half years, his disciples preached only to the Jews. And we read that in the book of Acts, chapter 1 through 6. Okay, let me interject. He preached only to the Jews, Daniel's people. That's what it said in Daniel's prophecy. Seventy Daniel's weeks are determined people, upon thy people and thy holy thy city. People. That's right. Just, just, just making sure the people don't lose the connection with Daniel's prophecy. When we say Jews, those are Daniel's people. Okay, back to you then. So after his resurrection and then for another three and a half years, his disciples preached only to the Jews. At the end of that second three and a half year period, in 34 AD, the bold last prophet God sent, Stephen, was stoned to death by the Jewish Sanhedrin, as we read in Acts chapter 7. This infamous deed marked the then ruling Jewish leader's final, the then ruling Jewish leader's official rejection of the gospel of our Savior. Then, after the stoning of Stephen, the gospel went to the Gentiles. Now, Tom, we have reached an hour already in our broadcast for today. And I don't want to extend much above an hour because we know that people need a little bit distraction after that time because they are not able to concentrate for so much longer. But I suggest to you, Tom, that next time, we, before we continue in that paper, which is still interesting, I would very much like to, if you say that's okay, to read Acts chapter 7, and the last cry of the last prophet Stephen to the Jews. Because that, I think, is a wonderful part of the Bible that Certainly gives us is. complete and more understanding even of really the fulfillment of the end of the 70th week when Jesus mm -hmm. Christ was in the Spirit teaching through his disciples, through his apostles, and through the prophet Stephen. That's an excellent idea. I very much look forward to that, Tom. Because reading the Bible, reading from the New Testament, proving by reading the New Testament that the 70th week of Daniel is completely and perfectly fulfilled by Jesus Christ as Stephen pleaded for more than 50 verses as far as I remember in Acts chapter 7 is something I would very, very much look forward to. Not only reading but first reading and then discussing, verse by verse, Acts chapter 7, proving to you that Jesus was the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel, that Jesus is the Christ, and that anybody who tells you otherwise is the Antichrist. That is then something for you to look forward to our next broadcast, and I want to leave concluding remarks of this broadcast to Tom. Please, brother. That's right. Stephen gave the Jews and Jerusalem one final witness of the truth. And it's remarkable what Stephen did and what he said. And it'll add so much depth of understanding 
of the appropriateness of the conclusion of the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy. No more gloriously could God have framed the ending of that 70th and final week than Stephen's prophetic testimony to the Sanhedrin. And uh, after we read the account of Stephen's testimony before the Sanhedrin, I don't see how anyone can continue to believe that any portion of the 70th week of Daniel is yet to be fulfilled in the future. It'll put a period on this subject forever for you. And you can thank God for his unmerited favor and mercy for making it available to you free of charge. I'll see you next week. Do